Uh, so first lecture is with regards to variceal bleeding, the new treatment guidelines. And I have no relevant disclosures. We'll be focusing on two of the most recent guidelines. One is Bavino 6, and then the other you'll be familiar with from the American Association of uh, the Study of Liver Disease in 2016, lead author, Dr. Uh, Guadalupe Garcia Sao. So we have a lot to cover in 20 minutes, esophageal varices, and um, I'm going to attempt to cover gastric varices, and I just hope you can get some practical take-home points. So let's start with a case. Imagine yourself in your clinic. You've got a 55-year-old male who comes in with child pu A cirrhosis. He's got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You've got lots of data on him, but his platelet count is 170. And his fibro scan, which is done with an XL probe, comes out to 18 kilopascals. So first question, do you need to do a gastroscopy to screen for varices in this gentleman? How many, put up your hands, how many would do a gastroscopy in this man? using that data. So actually, one of the very useful tips from the guideline is that we don't need to do a gastroscopy in that gentleman. So we can use liver stiffness less than 20 kilopascals and platelet count over 150. Those patients have a very low probability, so less than 5% of having high-risk varices, and you can avoid gastroscopy in them. And that circumvents 25% of gastroscopies in your clinical practice, so really a, a very important take-home point. Now fast forward two years, unfortunately this gentleman, he's continued to gain weight, he's uh, got child pub disease now, he's decompensated with the diuretic controlled ascites, and so of course a repeat gastroscopy is indicated, and this time you see large esophageal varices without high risk stigmata. So how many think he should be given primary prophylaxis at this point in time? Yeah, so he definitely should. And so who meets criteria for primary prophylaxis? And in, in these patients, really, there's three major things that will increase your risk of bleeding. One is your child pew class, or your liver disease severity. The other is the size of the varices, and you can see different grading systems, but in general, medium and large are classified as large or high risk. And then there's the presence of red whale signs on the varices that are high risk. So who meets criteria? It would be anyone with medium or large varices, and those patients with small varices who have red whale signs, that's not very common, so those high-risk stigmata, or small varices with decompensated disease, so typically your child PUC or a patient with ascites. Now, what do we use? And the key point to take home here is that non, uh, the, the, the beta blockers and endoscopic variceal ligation are really equivalent in preventing rebleeding, and this is a meta-analysis of trials looking at unpublished and published data that showed if you look at the very high quality studies with more than 100 patients, really these two are equivalent therapies. Importantly, many experts would support the use of, non, uh, of, of beta blockers as having additional clinical benefits over band ligation in reducing clinical decompensation and reducing infection as well as bacterial translocation. But in the guidelines, it's left up to your personal choice. What can we use for primary prophylaxis? The guideline provides really helpful tables. This is from the ASLD guideline. And so you can see that there's propranolol and natalol. And in this table for primary prophylaxis, which is different from secondary prophylaxis, we have carvedilol. So carvedilol, in addition to having the beta blocking effect, also has an alpha-1 adrenergic blocking effect. In general, you can start with a dose of 6.25 milligrams once a day and increase to a maximum dose of 12.5 milligrams once a day you can also then use variceal ligation. So going back to a, a, another case then, this is Mr. WW. So you're on call, you're called into the hospital, you're uh, going to see a 52-year-old gentleman with hepatitis C-related cirrhosis. He's got complications, so he's got ascites on diuretics, he's got a hepatic encephalopathy on treatment, he's vomiting up bright red blood, his hemoglobin 67, Blood pressure of 90 over 40, you can see his labs there, and his MELD score is 16 with a child PUC 10. So what are you going to do next for him? So just think in your head what the major things are for treatment. Um, important point is that we're actually very good at controlling bleeding. So only 10 to 20% of patients will we not be able to control their bleeding. And this is over time, it's significantly improved. 
What we do need to do better at is uh, improving and, and recognizing that we need to also reduce the rates of renal failure and liver failure and bacterial infection in these patients. So acute management then is not only going to focus on stopping the bleeding, but we're also going to reduce mortality by looking at non-bleeding related deaths and trying to maintain end organ perfusion such as to the kidneys. So four major things, resuscitation, vasoconstrictors, antibiotics, and your endoscopic therapy. Intubation, obviously, if needed, if, the, if he's actively vomiting and if he's not protecting his airway. Aiming for a systolic blood pressure of about 100 millimeters of mercury, mean arterial pressure of 65. Very important in your resuscitation, that we have evidence for a restrictive transfusion strategy, and this is a paper that you'll be familiar with from the New England Journal of Medicine, in which a third of the patients uh, enrolled had cirrhosis. This was 921 patients. And so the restrictive transfusion is a hemoglobin of uh, aiming for a target of less than 70, uh, ranging from 70 to 90, or transfusing at a hemoglobin of less than 90, aiming for a range of 90 to 110. And importantly, this is not for someone who has a massive variceal hemorrhage. They were excluded. What did this show? In the cirrhotic patients, it showed that it, actually, in all patients, it showed that it reduced mortality. If you look at the patients with cirrhosis, so this is in the green, it also reduced mortality, just trending when you include all patients, and a definite uh, reduction in mortality in looking at just the child pew A and B. Very difficult to change mortality, as we know, in the child pew C patients. What about correcting coagulation parameters? And in both the ASLD guideline and in the Bavino consensus, they suggest that they cannot make recommendations uh, on the basis of currently available data. What would I suggest? I mean, we know that DDAVP and Factor 7A have not shown benefit. I think it would be reasonable, and in my practice I do this, platelet transfusion if your platelets are less than 50, but again, that's not evidence-based. And then uh, checking a fibrinogen in a serious bleed as well. So if your fibrinogen level is less than or equal to 1, our hematologist would support giving cryoprecipitator or factor. Okay, then the second um, item after resuscitation is vasoconstrictors, and we know that vasoactive drugs should be started as soon as possible, so before endoscopy, and continued for up to five days, so two to five days. We have octreotide, vasopressin, and terlipressin, and I understand you're very lucky and you have terlipressin available to you. We have just octreotide. The benefits of vasoconstrictors are many, and this is a meta-analysis of 30 randomized control trials. They reduce mortality, they increase hemostasis, they reduce the number of blood products you need, and they reduce the number of days in hospital. And importantly, within study limitations, uh, as far as this meta-analysis and then another large Korean study of over 700 patients, there was no significant differences between those three therapies that I mentioned. Third important treatment is antibiotics. 50% of these patients will get an infection in hospital if you don't give them antibiotics. And this is a, a very nice um, Cochrane meta-analysis uh, from Mexican authors looking at 12 trials evaluating antibiotic therapy versus placebo. And we know without a doubt that antibiotics reduce mortality, reduce bacterial infections, reduce rebleeding, and reduce hospital rates. What antibiotics should we use? And I know in Mexico you also struggle with um, antibiotic resistance. And so at the recent um, uh, Bavino conference and then also supported by the ASLD guideline, a change was made from suggesting quinolone as the primary antibiotic to actually suggesting ceftriaxone in most patients. But this really should be based on your local antimicrobial susceptibility patterns. But very reasonable to, to use ceftriaxone one gram uh, every 24 hours as the first choice in, in most patients and definitely in those with advanced cirrhosis. This should be given for a duration of five to seven days. Other practical considerations which we try to remember are erythromycin and this helps to empty the stomach and so if you don't have QT prolongation you can use 250 milligrams IV 30 to 120 minutes before endoscopy. In patients who are refractory bleeders, so you've done your endoscopic therapy, you've done your, uh, your vasoconstrictor therapy and they're still bleeding, we are then, for, for trying to um, bridge them, we are using either Blakemore tubes or we're using um, stents. And in our hospital, we don't have a lot of experience with the stents, but in the guideline, it does suggest that self-expanding covered esophageal metal stents 
maybe a safer option than balloon tamponade in these patients who have refractory bleeding. And that's supported by a randomized control trial from Spain as well as a systematic review. Now what about tips? And there's two different situations to consider tips in. One is, as we mentioned, a patient who has bleeding that you can't control, so they've failed. So you temporize them by putting in the Blakemore or the esophageal stent, and then you do a rescue tips. So that's one place we use tips. The other idea is an early tips or a preemptive tips. And this is in patients who you've stopped the bleeding, but they have high risk features that would suggest that we should maybe tips them so that they don't bleed again. And the data from this uh, comes from a randomized control trial in the New England Journal of Medicine of 63, so not very many, 63 high-risk patients with acute variceal bleeding, and they defined high risk as child QB with active bleeding or child QC, and notably less than 14 points. So they gave them vasoactive drugs and endoscopic treatment and antibiotics, randomized them to standard therapy or an early tips within 72 hours of presentation. And what they found is that you improved with the early tips bleeding as well as improved survival quite significantly. There's been subsequent studies to try and redefine what does high risk mean? Is it really child QB with active bleeding and child QC? And the majority of studies that have come out have suggested that really that actively bleeding child QB group is not a high risk. They're just an intermediate risk group. So the suggestion then is that in patients at high risk, and I would suggest the, the Bovino guideline should be changed to just child pew class C from recent evidence, who have no contraindications for TIPS, then you may consider in selected patients a preemptive TIPS. And in a recent European analysis, only you know, less than 10% of, of patients who were candidates for this were actually getting it. So I don't think it's a widely used therapy. Okay, so our patient, he's treated with all of the therapies that we need. We decide against preemptive tips. He's had a history of hepatic encephalopathy. And his blood pressure post-admission day five is 115 over 70. He's got a stable hemoglobin. So what are we going to do for secondary prophylaxis at this point? And why is it important? And it's important because if we just let him go out the door without doing anything, he will bleed 60% uh, at one year. So this study, I think, is an individual patient meta-analysis and very helpful um, uh, conclusions from this, and this is what the guideline is based on. It is an individual patient meta-analysis of seven studies which compared combination therapy versus single therapy, so versus beta blockers or versus endoscopic variceal ligation. And the main conclusions are use combination therapy for secondary prophylaxis in all patients and that your, your benefits are going to vary depending upon your child pew. So if your child pew A, you reduce rebleeding without changing your mortality, which is reasonable. These guys don't have a very high mortality. In the Bs and Cs, you actually do reduce rebleeding and mortality with combination therapy. And as you'll see here on the, on the bottom in the green, uh, ligation alone is suboptimal to combination therapy very clearly. And so Beta blockers are the backbone of combination therapy. That's essential to use unless you have contraindications. Now, what do we use? So, natalol or propranolol. Notably, carvedilol is not on this list, and carvedilol does not have any studies um, in secondary prophylaxis. We should combine this with endoscopic band ligation, and again, uh, the, the guideline is every one to four weeks. And it should really start as soon as possible at discharge. Now, another very important point, and I think a lot of people are scared of using beta blockers in patients who have ascites. We can use it in patients who have ascites. In these patients, though, we need to avoid high doses of beta blockers. So the guideline would suggest, based on observational trials, that you stay at less than 160 milligrams a day of propranolol or less than 80 milligrams uh, per day of natalol. And I don't think many of us actually reach those doses in these patients. Who should you discontinue it in? You should discontinue in those patients who have refractory ascites and evidence of severe circulatory dysfunction. So that is either their blood pressure is less than 90, their sodium is less than 130, or they have hepatorenal syndrome, their creatinine is over 1.5. And in those patients, likely discontinue or, or decrease and restart as the situation improves. Okay, then a very quick foray into gastric varices. The classification for gastric varices is as per the sarin classification. The most common varices are the gastroesophageal ones with 
The ones at highest risk of bleeding are the isolated gastric varices here, followed by your gastroesophageal varices too, and then your ectopic varices. So we won't cover the treatment of uh, gastroesophageal varices because you treat them just like esophageal varices. We know very importantly that there's limited evidence. So unlike esophageal varices, we don't have a lot of trials in this. So a lot of this is based on expert consensus or very few uh, studies. And I understand you do have glue available here, which is fantastic. So the Bavino guideline is probably more applicable than the uh, ASLD guideline, which is in America, they don't have uh, glue available. So we know glue is a first line with uh, transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunts. Another therapy that I want to cover, and I'll just mention it briefly, is, uh, is BRTO, or balloon retrograde transvenous obliteration. And this is different than TIPS, okay? So what you do is you um, retrogradely cannulate the renal vein, you uh, inflate the balloon, and you inject a sclerosant into the, into the gastric varices. And so you're not actually redirecting the portosystemic um, flow in this situation. Who would you do this in? So it requires a gastrorenal shunt, and the majority of cardiofundal varices that we talked about do have a gastrorenal shunt. And it needs a radiologist who's able to do this and has expertise in this, probably more importantly. Now, we know that, that this therapy can cause portal hypertension. Uh, and so ascites and hydrothorax can develop in 30% of patients. In patients who have a high gradient, a high hepatic venous pressure gradient over 12, after they've done the BRTO, often we do combine this with a TIPS procedure at the same time. So who would you prefer this in? You'd prefer it in patients who don't have any ascites or evidence of portal hypertension, those who have hepatic encephalopathy because you're blocking off this shunt, which might also reduce their HE symptoms, and in those who TIPS is not effective. So for the primary prophylaxis of cardiofundal varices, these are patients who have not bled before, and the data here is really soft one study. Um, and the, the guidelines would suggest that the Bavino guidelines say it, we need further studies, they wouldn't do it. The ASLD guidelines suggest that in patients who have higher risk varices, and again, the definition of this is up for debate as well, but in this, the one study by Mishra in 2011, they used uh, high risk varices as size over um, 10 millimeters. In those patients, ASLD suggests non-selective beta blockers are the least invasive, but this study actually suggested that glue would probably be the, the most efficacious, and I think you wouldn't be wrong for considering either of those given the, the limited data that's available or even not to treating. Importantly, TIPS and BRTO are not indicated for primary prophylaxis. They increase adverse outcomes. What about the acute bleeders? So the initial management, same four things as uh, the esophageal variceal bleeders, so your resuscitation, your vasoconstrictors, antibiotics, and endoscopic therapy. And I would suggest that what we do and what you likely do is glue if it's available. And if you don't have glue or you can't control the bleeding, then you go to TIPS or BRTO with additional embolization of these spontaneous collaterals at the time of TIPS. And secondary prophylaxis, so patients who have recovered from the bleed, the guideline would suggest using, again, this is the Bavino guideline that I'm basing it on, glue repeated every two to four weeks, with or without, and probably going with, uh, a non-selective beta blocker. If no glue, or if they re-bleed, then a TIPS or a BRTO. So what do I want you to take home from this? For esophageal varices, first off, there's no need for screening in all patients. We can Avoid screening in patients who have transient elastography less than 20 and a platelet count over 150. They have a very low risk of having high-risk varices. For primary prophylaxis, beta blockers are equivalent to endoscopic variceal ligation. For the acute bleed, four major things, restrictive transfusion, ceftriaxone as your primary choice for antibiotics, vasoconstrictors, which reduce mortality, and your endoscopic therapy. For secondary prophylaxis, main take-home point is that your non-selective beta blocker is the backbone of the combination therapy. There's no role for carvedilol in secondary prophylaxis. For gastric varices, it's more complicated in the sense that there's limited data. For the gastroesophageal varices, treat as for esophageal varices. And for the cardiofundal varices, primary prophylaxis, really it's debatable whether we should be treating, but if you do, the guidelines would support beta blockers. 
I think you could be okay with glue as well. With the acute bleed glue and a rescue tips or BRTO and secondary prophylaxis. Again, consider combination therapy with glue and beta blocker or tips or BRTO. So we really need more studies in that area. And that's my first talk. Thank you.